Today on Exploring Scotland's History, we're going to give you something of the history and the myth surrounding our little village of Tynault in Argyll. Glenant was used because of its natural woodland and when we get a wee bit further around the circular walk, we'll show you why. Not all plans come together, the bridge is out, but we'll let you have a wee look at the platform that we're going to talk about now. Glen Nant is the beginning of the history of the smelting in the area. We couldn't get to the particular platform I wanted to go to because the bridge was down. But in this area there are lots of platforms and mounds and that indicates that people were burning charcoal in this area. The area is also teeming with various mosses and lichens and ants and it's actually a sign that the air here is very very clean. So in order to make the charcoal the local oak trees would have been harvested. They would have been cut into four foot lengths and piled sometimes up to 25 foot high and 15 foot wide. It would then have been covered with wet leaves and moss and a small fire lit underneath in order for the wood to burn extremely slowly and form the charcoal. Not however a fast process it would have been constantly monitored day and night while it slowly burnt for up to an entire month. Charcoal making, however, could be quite a dangerous occupation. There are stories of people burnt alive when the mounds have collapsed down around them and they were tending them. We will notice when we walk through here that nearly all the old oak trees have been coppiced. That is to say the main trunk would have been removed and that would have encouraged lots of smaller side trunks, branches to grow and produce more wood obviously for the charcoal industry. The charcoal industry was seasonal and people would have lived in these woods in small huts or man-made tents for the whole of the season to be close obviously to the charcoal mines to tend them. The main body of people that would have been working up in these hills were local people who all spoke Gaelic. There's a very good example of coppicing there. So once the whole process would have been completed, the charcoal was ready to go to the furnace, which is where we will visit next. So that's the Glen Nant circular walk bringing in the charcoal mines. Uh, the circular walk takes about an hour and a half, two hours. Depends how many photographs you take and how many times you stop. You can imagine how long it's just taken me. Now that we have our charcoal, it comes to the far side of the village here, to the Bon Aw Iron Furnace. Bon Aw is the most complete charcoal fired furnace in the British Isles. The furnace was opened in 1753, but why here? Well, as we saw in Glen Nant, there was quite a 
abundance of oak and that was required for the charcoal. Also, we need water. We've got plenty of water on the west coast of Scotland. It's barely ever dry. The Nant River and the Edith River would be conjoined to give a decent amount of water running to this furnace to power the mill. Like I say, the charcoal obviously came from a local source. The limestone came from Northern Ireland and the iron ore came from Cumbria. And they all came in by boat up Loch Edith and onto Kelly's Pier, which we will show you when we finish the furnace. At its height, Bono was supplying 700 tonnes of pig iron a year. It was employing 600 people, which is quite impressive for a little village this size when the summer brings its population up to about 800. It's worth pointing out that we have our local Gaelic speaking folk living up in the hills and huts to produce the charcoal that the furnace workers were given nice stone houses. In addition to their stone houses, they were also given grazing rights and allotments in the village of Tenault. 20 furnace workers were shipped up from Cumbria to assist in the building, the design and starting to run the furnace. I would imagine that must have been fraught with difficulties in the formative years when they spoke English and all the locals spoke Lorne Gaelic. But no furnace generally produced pig iron but it also produced cannonballs. Many for the Wars of Independence in America and also the Napoleonic Wars. There is a record of 42,000 cannonballs being sent to assist the fight that Horatio Nelson was having in Trafalgar. This is the charging house. This is where the raw materials would have been carefully weighed before being loaded into the furnace. This is the lade and it would have carried the water from the River Awe and the River Nant and taken it into a cast iron water wheel for the workings of this place. You can see why it's the most preserved in the British Isles. It is absolutely massive. You know, it takes a big, big site and there's a lot of buildings still intact. This apparently is where the smithy would have hung out. I imagine repairing tools that would have been needed to keep this edifice going. This has been stamped. I don't know whether it's the maker. The indication of these beams are that they were made in Newland in Cumbria. This is where lintels were produced. I thought this red sandstone is also from Cumbria. And the slates definitely are, as they are the Cumbrian greenstone slates. Before the buildings were taken into care, they were used by the villagers for chicken houses. Apparently the chickens were always pink from scraping through the ash and the hematite. And yes, that looks very, very pink. But you can step right into the furnace. Wow. The furnace is said to be associated with a lot of the Argyle Seer's prophecies, called Acrosta. He predicted that wooden horses with canvas reins would come up the lock and change things forever. It's interpreted that that is the ships that came through Connell, that's sort of narrowing in um, the lock and headed up the way here with the iron ore. He also predicted a great change would happen when the River Awe and the River Nant would be conjoined. Obviously when he said that no one was listening. 
And when the furnace was built, the first thing they did was conjoin the two rivers in order to get enough of water supply for the furnace. Colacrosta also had a prediction about what would become the manager's house, Bono House. In Gaelic, it translates to Big House of the Lock of the Bones. That doesn't sound good. The Irish are involved. There's a surprise. A Scottish guy had left this area as part of the Argyle Militia to fight in Ireland. When he was there, he met a girl called Molly and the old story fell in love. But her brothers weren't too happy. She was a good Catholic girl and he was a Protestant soldier. So they decided that they were going to ambush him one night. So he was out with Molly. The two brothers ambushed him. A fight ensued. He swung for one of the brothers, got Molly instead and killed her stone dead. He fled Ireland really quickly there. As time went on, he moved up into the huts in Glen Nant and started working on the charcoal. He had a fantastic singing voice. The death of Molly had caused him a breakdown and he had written a lament in her name, which apparently is still sung in Lord. So his voice was well renowned in the area. As we already know, he was well renowned in Ireland. What he didn't realise was a lot of Irish people came over here to work in the furnace, probably on the line boats to clear out the impurities. So he's singing merrily away and these two guys recognise his voice and realise that he's the guy that killed Molly. By accident, but he took her life. So they exact their revenge and they kill him. And they put his bones into what is said to be the foundations of Bono House. And that's where the house gets its name. And it is said traditionally that the house will never see joy or laughter. Aside from the Sears tall tales, we have pig iron and we have cannonballs and they need to head somewhere. So we're going to head down to the pier. Now we have dropped down to Pierside, where the goods that had been made in the furnace would have come down for their export and all the bits and pieces that we talked about that had to come into the furnace would have come in through here as well. The pier was named after Kelly, who was one of the managers. I would imagine with a name like Kelly, he was a good Irish lad. I've already heard there was quite an Irish contingency of workers up and around the furnace. This main pier is made of granite and the Cumbrian ships would have berthed here to drop off the raw materials and again on the return to lift the pig iron and the cannonballs. Loch Edith itself has some very interesting history and old tales surrounding it. I'll put a video up now to one of the trips we did out in the canoe where we went right on down the lock and found some old forts and things like that. So this is the length of the pier and quite a lot of the land at the back of the pier is scheduled right up to the furnace where we were. Like I say, most of this pier is made of granite but at the very end, there are some old wooden stanchions that have rotted away, just with the elements. These are the remnants of the Victorian era. These would have been put here in the Victorian era, specifically for the pleasure boats that were really quite popular at that time. Unfortunately, it's 
fallen into the lock now and to be honest the more modern stuff looks on its way out as well. This is where the cannonballs for Nelson and his Battle of Trafalgar would have left Hinault and headed on their journey. Nelson has his own monument in the village and we'll go up and see it now and finish the story of why he does figure in this tiny little village in Argyle. So this is the first monument that was erected in Nelson's memory. It was erected in 1805 after his death at Trafalgar. It's a granite monolith and was found further down the bay at Airds. Although recumbent, there was other stones in the field that would suggest that it has maybe historically been part of a stone circle. The funds to erect Nelson's monument were from public subscription, requested by none other than Queen Victoria herself. Fun fact, Queen Victoria was presented with the very bullet that killed Horatio Nelson a few years after his death. This standing stone is also a memorial to all the Scotsmen who stood alongside Horatio Nelson and fell at the Battle of Trafalgar. <laughs> 